sexual assault, abusive behaviour, the exploitation of women by men. These are vital issues for our society to address. We need a revolution. But instead of advancing that cause, Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee undermined it last week with pompous grandstanding and cheap moralising despite their own giant character flaws. More Democrat hypocrisy on Brett Kavanaugh is this week's Swamp Watch. Let's start with Senator Cory Booker. There are dark elements that allow unconscionable levels of, unacceptable levels of sexual assault and harassment. You are opening up to open air hurt and pain that goes on across this country. As you are speaking truth that this country needs to understand. I agree, and I can think of one person in particular who needs to understand, Cory Booker himself. In college, he wrote a thoughtful article examining his own past sexual misdeeds, including groping a woman without consent while she was drunk. To his credit, back then, Booker used the incidents to highlight his own evolution on these issues. But in 2013, while mayor of Newark, Booker was caught exchanging salacious messages with a stripper. Lindsay Lee was reportedly working at Casa Diablo, which touted itself wait for it, as the world's first vegan strip club. She told Cory Booker that the West Coast and she loved him and that, quote, if you're POTUS, I call dibs on first lady. Booker replied, the East Coast loves you, and by the East Coast, I mean me. She responded, well, now I'm blushing. I bet you are Lindsay. In Thursday's hearing, Cory Booker railed against a toxic culture and pernicious patriarchy, although flirting with a stripper, of course, is fine. See how that goes down at your next Me Too meeting, Senator. But that's not even the end of it. Over the years, Cory Booker has been a frequent visitor to my part of the world, Silicon Valley, to ingratiate himself with the tech elite and raise money. He's created quite the impression from every single person. You hear the exact same thing. Wow, what is going on with Cory Booker? He's a real mess. And that's from his donors. Look, I take a pretty libertarian attitude on all this. Winston Churchill was a massively heavy drinker and one of the greatest leaders in history. So, Senator Booker, I couldn't care less if your personal life is a mess, but I'm not the one moralizing on that committee. Here's another massive hypocrite, ranking Judiciary Committee member Dianne Feinstein. Check this out. Sexual violence is a serious problem and one that largely goes unseen. While young women are standing up and saying no more, our institutions have not progressed and how they treat women who come forward. That soapbox starts to look pretty flimsy when you consider how close Feinstein was to notorious womanizer Ted Kennedy. Here's what she said when he died. He was a colleague, an inspiration, and a friend. I have seen up close and personal his dedication to issues of civil rights, human rights, and basic fairness to all. Except the woman he exploited, right, Senator Feinstein, Ted Kennedy's sexual incontinence, included a 1990 report of being caught having sex in public on the floor of a Washington, D.C. restaurant with a lobbyist. How perfectly swampy. At least she lived to tell the tale, unlike poor Mary Jo Kopechny, who Kennedy left to drown at Chappaquiddick. How can Diane Feinstein be taken seriously on sexual violence when she called Ted Kennedy an inspiration? But there are plenty more Democrat hypocrites on her committee. Let's not forget Senator Patrick Leahy. He had this question on Thursday. In your yearbook, uh, you talked about drinking and sexual exploits, did you not? And did you not, Senator Leahy, deliver a speech on the Senate floor while drunk yourself? And then there's saintly Kamala Harris, crusader for justice and righteousness. She had this question for Kavanaugh. Do you agree that it is possible for men to both be friends with some women? and treat other women badly? Well, Senator Harris would know all about treating women and men badly. She's becoming notorious for abusive behavior towards her staff. Reports of the Kamala Harris's diva-like tantrums include an insistence on multiple meal options, only staying at top hotels like the Ritz-Carlton and the Waldorf Astoria, and refusing to eat food with anything except metal silverware. She wants forced a staffer to take a set from a donor's house. But that's not the worst of it. Harris has been described as prone to hostile outbursts, for example, she was witnessed aggressively berating an aide inside a Washington elevator. Multiple Democrat staffers have told me how badly she treats people, an open secret in Democratic Party circles. No one says anything, though, because they're frightened of reprisals from her powerful political machine. Senator Harris, before you lecture anyone else about their temperament, and quite honestly, before you run for president yourself, 
you might want to work on your own abusive behaviour. Look, of course we need to fight for gender equality and women's rights, but it's hard to imagine a worse bunch of people to do it than these Democrat hacks and hypocrites on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Up next, another heated debate. A son of immigrants tells us why open borders could lead to civil war. Don't go away. All right, as if we don't have enough to argue about, the debate over immigration continues to rage, and as the midterms approach, the question of what to do with the nation's borders will once again be in the spotlight. Here now with his take, executive editor of National Review and the author of Melting Pot or Civil War, A Son of Immigrants Makes the Case Against Open Borders, Raihan Salam, you saw him earlier. Um, tell us quickly the argument you're setting out in this book. The basic argument is that we as a country have abandoned the ideal of the melting pot. We've abandoned the idea that what we need is a unifying nationalism that can create a common culture. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have immigration policies that are actually exacerbating our divides. The idea that we might find ourselves in a civil war feels more real than ever, you know, this week in particular. And what I'm trying to do is offer mm -hmm. a positive populist program of a kind that I think your viewers would appreciate that's about how we can yeah. overcome those divides and build a new America that is richer, stronger, fairer, and that really works for all all Americans, regardless of class or ethnic background. So tell us some of the specifics in terms of a, of a potential plan to deliver that promise. Well, the heart of the idea is that right now our immigration system does not really serve our national interest. And that's one reason why it's engendered so much resentment. We have an immigration system that is not controlled, that people do not feel is actually speaking to their interests. Yeah. So the first, the heart of the idea is that we should have an immigration policy in which we select immigrants on the basis of how they can contribute to helping us overcome uh, all of the obstacles we face toward building a better, fairer society. And that's why we need to have uh, really a, a more selective approach. But we might also need some kind of amnesty, some kind of path to legal status, provided we have true control over who comes in and who leaves this country. I think some of that people will be cheering and saying, yes, proper, proper uh, merit-based immigration. The, the, the other part of it, you know, the, the legalization, people say, well, fine, but it never happens, and you never get the border security component of it. Um, what's your response to that criticism? My response is that when you've seen bipartisan immigration deals in the past, they haven't been truly bipartisan. They've been fake bipartisan. They've been an alliance between people who want cheap labor, they want guest workers, and people who want amnesty, rather than between those who want to deal with folks who've been in the country for a long period of time unlawfully, with those who want control and want a national interest immigration policy. That's why I offer a specific proposal saying that you are not going to have any kind of pathway unless mm -hmm. it's done in concert with a true national interest immigration policy that allows us to actually have the kind of intermarriage, intermingling that created the melting pot majority that made this country great. Uh, you know, in the decades following the Second World War, that was so essential Richard. to making us the greatest country Richard. in the world. Sorry, Ray, time to cut you. I just want to make sure Richard and Lisa can get in. Richard, what, I mean, can you see Democrats getting behind anything? Well, I think there are a lot of Democrats can get away with the, the idea that we have to find a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented that are here. And we also have to deal with the fact that there is a good part of those undocumented folks that have become part of our economy. Whether we like it or not, they're the people that take care of our kids, they're the people that clean our homes, they're the people that work on construction sites, they're the people that work at Mar-a-Lago. Over and over again, they're individuals who come to this country want nothing but the American dream. With that being said, yeah. we do have to find a way to make sure that there there is some level of security on the border. I'm not saying a wall is the answer, but we saw President Obama under his term double the amount of spending on the border and double the border patrol. Maybe we can use drones. Maybe we you can use other type of investments. Okay. The idea of just building a wall and think that's going to solve but, the problem. But sorry, just, I just want to be quick. Last I, words, I, Rayhan. Sorry, I want to get Lisa, and I'm so sorry. Quick last thought. Oh well, no. I, but the point is dealing with the individuals that are here illegally. The point is we want to enforce a border to ensure that this problem doesn't get further exasperate, I agree. exasperated. And also what was mentioned was merit-based immigration. This is something that President Trump brought forward with the RAISE yeah. Act, and he was labeled a xenophobe for simply I just think wanting to have an immigration system. I trying to do is actually right. have a reasonable conversation about it. Look, I'm so sorry we're out of time, but, but you're going to be back with us, Rahani, in a couple of weeks here in L.A., and we can talk about it more then because it's a big issue, and uh, we've got to get, get some